shop on Electronics, Labour Physics, Media, QT. Thank you very much, um, and of course, thank you enormously to Robert uh, and Vishnu in particular for organising a, a really fantastic uh, week. Um, this is actually the first time I've, I've been in South Africa now for four years, and this is the first time I've sort of seen so many students coming together. Um, and this has been really, really interesting for me, and talking to lots of students has been um, really a great experience. So I hope we can do this more often. Um, thank you also to Vishnu for all the videography work that he's been doing. So I apologise that I'll be jumping back and forth a lot throughout. Um, so I'm going to talk about something pretty different from uh, what you've seen so far. This is based on work that I actually did, or the sort of foundations of it is, is based on work that I did a long, long time ago, and I haven't worked on it for, for quite a while. But over the last couple of years, I've been working with, um, uh, with these guys, um, uh, Alfonso, Matias, and Dimitrios, um, on a, a problem related to ads -QCD. And it's a particular um, phenomenon that seems to occur both in uh, a particular ads -QCD model, as well as we'll see, um, and other effective field theory models of, uh, of QCD. Um, so I, I know that many people come from sort of very different backgrounds in terms of what you've studied, so I'm going to go through this fairly pedagogically. I'm not going to worry too much, too much about factors of pi and two, but I'm going to sort of go through the basics of it reasonably, reasonably thoroughly. Um, so I do apologize that um, the, the styles throughout this presentation are going to change uh, considerably, so um, I apologize not for, uh, for that change of style. Okay, um, can you read this at the back? Yeah, okay. Um, so the outline of the talk, so we're just going to look at some, some questions, in particular in non-perturbative QCD. Um, uh, things like the QCD phase diagram, and we're going to be looking, um, using ADS-CFT methods for looking at uh, the phase diagram of QCD-like models. We've got to be careful here that we're never really looking at QCD, but QCD-like models um, in a sort of extended phase space um, in terms of turning on chemical potentials and finite magnetic fields. And this actually has some, some link with uh, both heavy ion collisions and the physics of neutron stars, in particular uh, magnetars, which are relatively slowly rotating um, uh, neutron stars but have enormously high magnetic fields um, of the order of uh, 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19 Tesla. Um, I'm going to talk about chiral symmetry breaking. Um, so that's sort of the foundation of, of quite a lot of this. Um, then talk about the comparison between QCD and N equals 4 CDA mills and see why we should um, want to do this at all. Okay, through a very simple ADS QCD model. And then the bulk of the talk will actually be about the Sakai Sugimoto model. Um, so out, out of interest, how many people here have, have studied the Sakai Sugimoto model? Very good. That, that's that's the, the right answer. Talk, okay, that's, that's fine. Um, so we're going to talk about the Sakai Sugimoto model, which is uh, one of the sort of leading theories, uh, a, a, an ADS QCD model, which gives us um, something pretty close to QCD in many ways. We're going to look at it at finite temperature, finite chemical potential, and finite magnetic field. Um, we're going to talk about magnetic catalysis of chiral symmetry breaking, and all of those words will make sense hopefully soon. And then the exotic part of all of this is actually going to be this inverse <coughs> magnetic catalysis. Um, so this work was done predominantly by um, Price, Reban, and Schmidt, and we've extended it and essentially um, re removed all of the approximations that they've made, and we've done a, a full calculation of that. And that's been on the order of a year and a half of numerics. Um, luckily, I like numerics. Um, so just to give a very sort of quick uh, overview of this, we've got this lovely um, sort of evolution that we started trying to understand the strong force in terms of uh, hadronic interactions, and from that actually came the idea of strings, um, the, the fact that uh, there were these dualities between different modes um, in hadronic interactions in particular, in pionic interactions with rho meson, uh, with vector meson exchange. Um, and then strings, we realized, were actually a theory of quantum gravity. Um, but in fact, we've now realized through ADS-CRT that string theory gives us also a description, a duality between gravitational theories and Yang-Mills theories. And we can now make them look something like QCD. And so we can sort of understand the strong force uh, in this nice uh, cyclical way. Um, of course, we have to ask, if we're studying QCD, whether we're interested in perturbative or non-perturbative questions. And in general, the stuff that we'll be interested in here is going to be um, when, the, when the coupling is strong. There's, of course, some uh, extremely interesting work going on at the moment uh, related to, to perturbative QCD. And although, in general, all of the sort of spinner helicity formalism looks like it's related to N equals, N equals 4 super mills, there are extensions where we can actually ask questions about, uh, about QCD. 
naively within QCD, we've got this relatively simple phase structure that we've got a confined phase and a deconfined phase. But even that, of course, we don't really understand just from looking at a QCD Lagrangian. Or the, the Young Miller Lagrangian, I should say. Okay, so the, the sorts of questions one might ask. Um, at strong coupling, you can ask about the, the spectra of bound states, so blue ball spectra within pure Yang Mills. One can ask about confinement and the pure Yang Mills phase diagram. Uh, you can turn on uh, temperature and ask when, when is the confinement, deconfinement phase transition. Um, if we add quarks to the picture, and much of what I'm going to talk about is, is related to adding fundamental matter, um, then we have a, an enormous uh, plethora of questions that we can, we can ask about hadronic physics. Of course, there's a much richer phase diagram. We can now think about turning on a baryon chemical potential, a baryon density. We can think of turning on uh, electric and magnetic fields, which couple to the fundamental matter. Um, so there's an extremely rich phase, phase structure there. Um, one can ask then about the, the spectrum of hadrons uh, and their decay constants. Um, and in fact, all of these things can be studied from within an ADS QCD context. There are other ways to do it, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, but the ADS, ADS CFT correspondence gives us an avenue to really understand um, at least perhaps universal properties um, of, of some of these, uh, these concepts. As I said, this has relevance to, in particular, heavy ion collisions. Um, in fact, even in heavy ion collisions, if you have far off-center heavy ion collisions, then you get accelerated charges, um, and in fact, you get on the order sort of 10 to the 17 Tesla um, magnetic fields there. So the, some, of the prop, some of the phenomena that I'll be talking about there, we really have to understand them if we want to understand the way probes move through um, the, the sort of aftermath of a heavy ion collision. Um, in fact, even in hadronic collisions, um, of course, much of this is, is relevant. When you have hadronization after you've uh, broken up into your constituent quarks, they, they hadronize, and to try to understand that, we really have to understand both about the hadronic spectrum and the decay constant. Um, and then, as I said before, magnetars. <clears throat> so we have many ways to understand, to, to try to study non perturbative QCD. Um, well, lattice QCD we have, um, uh, this gives us, you know, we, we have a, a sort of way of studying QCD at, at strong coupling, but it's numerical and it's very difficult in that case to really un understand the, the fundamental physical laws which are governing the phenomena that you see. Um, and of course, there's the so-called sign problem which comes about when you try to introduce a chemical potential. Um, and essentially, the, the weighting then in your Monte Carlo simulations uh, becomes ill-defined. There are effective methods. So we can write down something like a nambu jonah Licinia model, which corresponds to having a four-quark um, non-renormalizable non theory, so it's, there's a four fermion interaction, you introduce some sigma and pi fields as auxiliary fields, they interact with the, um, with the underlying fermions, you integrate out the fermions and you end up with an effective theory of pions, which actually tells you an enormous amount about the, uh, the underlying structure of real QCD in terms of things like chiral symmetry breaking. Um, you can also look at heavy quark effective theory, so you can say well, if my, my coupling constant goes large and I can't do a perturbative expansion in that, it turns out that you can actually do an, uh, a perturbative expansion um, in one over the, uh, the heavy, quark, uh, heavy quark masses. And then, of course, we can ask about one over n expansions. And what it seems to be is that as we perform an expansion in one over n, we can rearrange our degrees of freedom. And miraculously, the effective degrees of freedom seem to be a, a massless tensor with two indices, each of which runs over um, 10, 10 values, so it seems to be that we get we get some string theory uh, from from one of the one over any expansion of QCD. Of course, we don't actually know how to how to perform this um, in QCD, but um, what we'll see is that from holography, we have a way in to maybe alter the, the theory. So rather than having n equals four super Yang mills, we can alter the theory enough that it starts to look something like real QCD. So the QCD phase diagram, um, if we're just looking in terms of temperature and net baryon density, well, there's a first order phase transition, um, and we go from a hadronic phase to a, a quark gluon plasma. Um, if you go to very high net baryon density, you get to the color superconducting phase, um, where you get a color flavor, flavor locking, and it seems that there may be some kind of crystalline structure out here. In fact, for real QCD, um, the, the tra transition between hadrons and quarks and gluons seems to go uh, through a, a crossover here, not really a first order phase transition. And in fact, the heavy ion collisions that we have at the moment probably um, are, are around about that crossover point. 
In fact, it's rather difficult to model these crossovers in ADS-QCD models. Generally, this, this sort of phase transition comes out as a first or second order phase transition, but well, in this case, a first order phase transition. Um, but still, we can ask about the, the, the sort of uh, the properties when we're in the quark gluon, gluon plasma phase from ADS-QCD. At the chiral condensators, I'll talk about um, shortly in the confinement deconfinement phase transition. So this is the confined phase, and this is the deconfined phase. These are closely related, but not necessarily exactly the same point. So I, I want to just go through very quickly some some basics of chiral symmetry breaking. Um, so if you write down the QCD Lagrangian, so here we're just interested in the um, in the, the quark part, the fermionic part. Um, then the Lagrangian has a term which is something like psi bar uh, d slash i d slash. Not visible. Not visible. Oh, okay. um, is that better? No. Nope. Nope. Like, like, this one here, right here. Thank you. Yes, OK. So we got something along the lines of psi uh, by d slash psi. We're here. Psi bar is simply psi adjoint uh, gamma zero. Um, and this psi field here, so psi, is made up of the Dirac fermion made up of left and right-handed fermions. Okay. Um, so we can think about QCD, for instance, with three flavors. So we just think of up, down, and strange quarks. The, the heavy quarks we're not going to be, be so interested in. And in fact, the, the number of quarks isn't going to matter too much. But there's a symmetry of this action because this term here, so although in your psi bar you've got a gamma zero, in your d slash you've got another gamma matrix. And what that means is that when you write this out, it, it splits into two terms, one of which just includes psi left and one of which just includes psi right. So essentially we end up with uh, psi bar left, um, something along the lines of id slash uh, psi left plus psi right, id slash psi right. Okay. I'm not being very careful of the uh, joint. Um, so it turns out that in fact there's a symmetry, there's a rotational symmetry where we can rotate uh, the left-handed and the right-handed quarks um, independently. So in fact, where there should be really be an index on, on here, psi a left, <coughs> psi a right, where a runs over up, down, and strange. And so here it looks like we have um, a u3 left cross u3 right symmetry. Okay. So we can rotate our left-handed quarks, we can rotate the up, down, and strange quarks into one another, and we can do the same thing for right. So we have a, a u3 left cross, cross u3 right symmetry. So in fact, we can write this, in this case, as su3 left cross su3 right cross u1 axial cross u1 vector. And it turns out that in QCD, the, the axial symmetry, um, the U1A there, is actually broken by a chiral anomaly. So it turns out that there's a, um, uh, an instant on within QCD from the, um, the F tilde F term, um, which leads to um, a non-conservation of the axial current. Okay. So this term is broken um, by the anomaly, chiral anomaly. And we're left with this. This U1V is actually the simply corresponds to the baryon current. So this is conserved, at least in QCD. Um, so we have here an SU3 left cross SU3 right. Um, if you turn on a mass, a mass term for QCD actually couples left right uh, quarks. And so this would then break down to just the vector part. Okay, so we couple them such that you could no longer rotate the left and right independently if you turn on a mass. You have, to, you have to rotate them in the same way. But if we have massless QCD, it would appear that this SU3 left cross SU3 right is preserved. In fact, what happens is that the gluon dynamics means that there's a QQ bar condensate. Okay? So in fact, there's a condensate of psi bar psi, not equal to zero. And this spontaneously breaks the symmetry 
down to the vector subgroup. Okay. Of course, when we have a spontane spontaneously broken symmetry, we end up with some Goldstone bosons. And in this case, because we're breaking this down to the vector subgroup, we end up with eight Goldstone bosons. Okay. If this were just a uh, single flavor, um, so rather than having up, down, and strange, if we just had a single flavor of quark, actually, we can think of this as just breaking um, a single uh, a single U1, um, uh, the, the uh, condensate here breaking a single U1, uh, and we'd end up in a single uh, single Goldstone boson. So this is the, the rough idea of chiral symmetry breaking, that this, this is the so-called chiral symmetry. Um, the, the full chiral symmetry here is broken down to the vector subgroup, and it's broken by condensate of side by side. So what we're going to see is that within QCD-like models of ADS QCD, all of this phenomenology is going to come out. Okay? We're going to find that the underlying theory appears to have um, a, a chiral symmetry, and it's broken by the condensation of a QQ bar condensate. Okay? So this is simply the, the, a vacuum expectation value for a particular operator, and we can see that operator on the field theory side from the, the behavior of fields in the supergravity side. Any questions about this? So I showed you previously the picture of the, the phase diagram of QCD, where we have temperature and baryon density. In fact, we can also turn on um, external fields as well. So we can think about having a theory with quarks, which are clearly charged under the color charge, but we can also think about the fact that they're charged under, under a U1, under an electric, uh, simply electromagnetic U1, and we can turn on background electric and magnetic fields. What we mean by background is that the the behavior of the, uh, the quarks does not back react on the electric and magnetic fields. We, we don't really think of these as dynamical fields. They're just background fields, and we're putting in uh, quarks as probes into those backgrounds. Okay. So it turns out that in ADS QCD, if you turn on an electric field, then you get, as you would expect, air creation. So what I'm going to talk about uh, shortly is that, in fact, to, to produce a model of ADS QCD, what you really need to do is to take your, your ADS background, ADS 5 process 5, and you need to put in some probe brains. So D3 brains, your stack of D3 brains, all of the strings that open and that start and end on a D3 brain correspond to a joint matter. So what we want is fundamental matter, charged into the fundamental uh, of the SUN gauge group. And to do that, we need something with a single end on a D3 brain. And in general, what we're going to do is to, to put a D7 brain in. D7 brain turns out to be the, the right brain, and I'll, I'll motivate that later. So it turns out that when we do this, when we take a D7 brain and we put it into this background and we turn on an electric field, all the properties that you would expect of pair creation come out, and we actually we find that the, the vacuum is unstable pair creation, and we end up with uh, a, a horizon-like surface <coughs> suddenly appearing on our D7 brain. Um, and what we showed was that, in fact, that horizon-like surface really does have uh, many of the properties that, that a real horizon has, and one can define a so-called electric membrane paradigm. Okay. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it's interesting to see the emergence of horizon-like uh, features coming from turning on electric fields in this ads pcd line model. Most of what I'm going to talk about is actually going to be related to turning on a magnetic field. Okay. It turns out that this QQ bar condensate, or sorry about psi condensate, um, the pairing of the, the QQ bar pairs is actually enhanced by turning on a magnetic field. This is actually related to um, the fact that when you turn on a magnetic field in a, in a theory uh, of, this, of this sort, um, there's a dimensional reduction and your theory ends up as being a, an effective one plus one dimensional theory. One can study the lowest Landau levels of this theory um, and you find that the, the QQ bar coupling is actually enhanced. Because it's enhanced, you get Carroll symmetry. Okay. So if you have a theory which may not have had chiral symmetry breaking before, by turning on a magnetic field, you get an enhancement um, in the QQ bar back. Yes? Could I ask about the previous thing you said? Yeah, and absolutely. You the pair creation, so that's like a Schwinger effect? It's exactly a Schwinger effect. Okay. So now with the Schwinger effect, there's no horizon kind of thing. So it's an like extra Schwinger plus some extra features. Good. So, so, I, I, so actually, this, this arrow here is slightly misleading. So all of this is in the field theory side. Okay. I take a, I take a QCD-like model, and I turn on an electric field, and I've got charged quarks, and indeed, indeed just as in a normal, uh, normal model, I have pair creation from the, the Schwinger mechanism. It turns out that in the, uh, in the ADS dual of that, which corresponds to putting D7 brains 
in a D3 brain background and turning on an electric field on the D7 brain, it's on the D7 brain that you get a what was originally called a singular shell and we then realized was really a, a horizon-like structure and you, from that you can define a membrane paradigm and the transport coefficients of the theory, things like the conductivity, can be calculated entirely from this, this membrane. But it's not a real horizon, it's just it's a horizon not, meeting a singularity kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. It's, it's a black hole zero area kind of horizon. Um, so I, I think to, to call it a black hole is actually is actually not quite correct. It, it's but there is a membrane paradigm. There's a, so exactly. So, so it's really absorptive, it's absorptive. Yeah, that, that's right. Mm. That's precisely right. So you, you get a uh, you get a sing an apparently singular surface, and in fact it comes from turning on a current. Um, and really the reason for this is because um, the the theory um, because you you don't have back reaction. Normally, if you turn on an electric field, some finite electric field in a theory, then you're going to end up with a polar a polarized vacuum, um, and after some point you're going to you're going to stop pair creating. In this theory, because there's no back reaction, in fact, you, the pair creation goes on forever, and that, that's really what caused There's no back reaction because you didn't put it in, or because it just... Yeah. No. Okay. It, it, yeah, so because you're, you're looking at a D7 brain in a D3 brain, brain background, without back reaction on the D3 brain background, um, you, you don't see it. But what it means is that you can actually define some thermal properties of this, um, of this horizon like structure. Yeah. <coughs> So the magnetic field enhances the, um, the coupling between the, between the quarks, um, and we get uh, an enhanced Q cube bar condensate. And what this means is that mag a magnetic field can catalyze chiral symmetry breaking. So this is called the catalysis of chiral symmetry breaking via a magnetic field. What we're going to talk about at the end is actually that sometimes when you turn on the magnetic field, what it does is rather than catalyzing chiral symmetry breaking, you get inverse magnetic catalysis, and it actually reduces the Q cube bar coupling. So this is sort of the exotic part of the, um, the, the title. In fact, it turns out that in order to get this effect, you need not only a magnetic field, but also a chemical potential. Okay. So it's reasonable to ask how close are QCD and N force 4 Super mills, at least the, the N force 4 Super mills in the large M limit that we're interested in for the ADS CFD correspondence. Well, QCD is non-conformal whereas any force of four super young males is conformal. QCB is not supersymmetric. Any force four super young males is highly supersymmetric. We have three colors of quarks, uh, whereas we take the number of quarks to infinity um, in the ABS CFT correspondence. Um, the value of NF uh, is equal to three. The number of flavors is equal to three. Well, like quarks is equal to three for QCD. And for any force four super young males, sorry, this should be equal to. Uh, and for any force four super young males, it's equal to zero. So it looks like a pretty terrible correspondence trying to model QCD by any force for super young males. So on the supergravity side, the conformal symmetry corresponds to the ADS symmetry. The supersymmetry corresponds to supersymmetries and also isometries uh, in the gravity theory. And C goes to infinity tells us that we have smooth, non-stringy geometries. And NF equals zero says that essentially we only have a pi form in our background. So can we change any of this and get a theory which looks somewhat more like QCD? So in order to make it more like QCD, in the supergravity background, we can break the ADS symmetry. So we can find some supergravity solution, which may be in the UV, in the, the large R region towards the boundary, does have a, an ADS, uh, ADS symmetry. Um, but in the infrared of the theory, that symmetry is broken. We can break the supersymmetry by taking some, some direction and compactifying it and looking at fermionic boundary conditions, uh, for, or fermions with antiperiodic boundary conditions. This is going to give fermions mass these fermions generally couple to scalars, and the scalars then get mass, um, and then we end up with something which is just pure, pure Yang mills. One can, in fact, look at um, uh, going away from the NC goes to infinity limit. Um, in particular, the most interesting ways, I think, are, are by adding in uh, D-brain probes, D7-brain probes, and looking at NF over NC effects. Okay. And in particular, turning on a finite number of flavors corresponds, at least in the ADS CFT correspondence with any force of super young mills, corresponds to adding D7 rooms. Okay. If you want to end up with a 3 plus 1 dimensional field theory of 3 plus 1 dimensional young mills theory with quarks, we need to add in D7 rooms. And generally, we do that uh, as probe brains because back reacting those brains on the background correspond is a, is a complicated calculation in general. And this corresponds to the, the quenched approximation. Is that a relation to 
Cassidy motor model by FT duality when you add D7 brains to the. Um, let's see. Yeah, effectively it is. So you, you can think, so we'll come to the Sakai Sugimoto model in a, in a moment. In fact, actually, it's D4 brains, so it's Witten's D4 brain background, and rather than putting D7 brains in, you put D8 brains in. So yeah, in, in that sense, it's a, it's a T duality. I, I don't think one can, I've never seen an explicit calculation that, that takes you from one to the other. Um, but there's, a, there's certainly a circle in the, in the Witten geometry, um, which you could think of T dualizing on. Um, and so I, I imagine they are linked by a duality, but I've never seen that done explicitly. Okay, so we can ask the question, can, can this actually be used uh, for LHC physics, for at least the, the non-perturbative aspects of LHC physics? Um, and in fact, there, there's been some success in the ADS QCD uh, world, trying to understand uh, strongly coupled QCD. Um, in particular, in terms of quark gluon plasma, so finite temperature heat confined QCD, the, the most famous result you would have heard of is this eta over s, um, the, the ratio of the shear viscosity to the entropy density, which seemed to be very close to that actually found at, uh, at heavy iron equilibrium. <coughs> what I'm going to be talking about here are, are models which really come from strain theory. So we start with some real uh, supergravity geometry coming from, from strain theory, and we put in uh, debray probes. In fact, many of the, the most sort of promising models of, uh, of ADS QCD really come from sort of toy models where we, we, we look at the symmetries that we want from QCD and we write down a model which might be simply an effective model and doesn't truly come from string theory, but is motivated by string theory. Um, so, um, Karitsis et al. have written some very, very effective models, which are effective models in the sense of being very, very good, um, we, which seem to mimic a lot of the uh, the phenomena of QCD, in particular getting the spectra of, of mesons and hadrons, um, spectra, uh, mesons and baryons, um, to, to pretty high precision. Okay. So before I move on to Sakai Sugimoto, I'm actually going to talk about a, another model which is in some senses easier to, to sort of visualize what is, what's going on. Um, this is the so-called so -called Constable Myers geometry. This was also studied by Gubsa, um, and it's called the, the Dilaton flow geometry by, by Gubsa. Um, and this is a theory which it breaks supersymmetry, so there's no supersymmetry in this uh, in this background. And what what we've done with, what we've done is we've turned on a Dilaton um, which has a flow, and the theory in the UV um, goes to an ADS geometry, just ADS five plus S five, and in the IR it turns out to be singular. Okay. So we don't want to get any near, anywhere near that singularity, but it turns out that if we take that geometry and we probe it with the D-brain, the D-brain naturally is, is re repelled from the singular region, and we can study the physics of the D-brain, which corresponds then to studying flavor physics, quark-like physics, um, uh, coupled to Yang metals. Okay. So it actually turns out that turning on the, the, the Dilaton uh, corresponds to turning on a VEV for a dimension 4 operator, okay, which, it, which is actually why there's a, a sick interval. So if we add a D7 brain into this geometry, then in the weakly coupled limits, we have D3, D7 strings, which correspond to quarks, and in the strongly coupled limit, we can study the, cube, the, the, the strings which start and end on a D7 brain. So these are, these are, um, in the, these are singlets under the SUN symmetry, um, and uh, by fundamentals we can think of uh, under the flavor symmetry, and these correspond to mesons. So strings which start and end on the D7 brain correspond to mesons um, of our so the D7 brain, in particular, it fills the ADS, so it fills all five of the ADS five directions, and it wraps an S3, so our D7 is eight dimensional, it's got <coughs> transverse directions. Um, it turns out that it's half, half BPS uh, in the ADS limit, and it leads to a, a stable IR. So I just want to very quickly give a, um, a picture of what's going on here. So let's just take pure ADS five cross S5. So if we look, look at the metric, um, of just ADS5 cross S5, we can write this in many different ways, but one way that we can write it, is this still relatively visible? Yeah. Um, we can write R squared dx parallel squared, and this is going to correspond to the 3 plus 1 dimensions of the D3 brain, so this is where our gauge theory lives, plus 1 over R squared dr squared plus R squared Emilia 5. Okay, that's not totally invisible. Say again? 
It's <coughs> that's totally invisible. Totally invisible. Okay. Um, is it because of the size of the writing? Or I the think it's pen? because of the light okay. and also the the pen. Yeah. <laughs> also the pen. I think. Is that going to be better or worse? <laughs> uh, that, uh, that's yeah. okay. So in fact, we can we can write this in a different way. We can write r squared with dx squared plus one over r squared d uh, row squared plus let's call it dw squared plus dy squared plus r squared d three squared, where r squared is row squared plus omega squared w squared plus y squared. So what we've done is this is simply a, a six a six dimensional uh, Euclidean uh, plane, and all we've done is we split it up to into a row direction, a w direction, a y direction, and a free sphere. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this geometry and we're going to prove it with a d7 brain, and the d7 brain is going to fill all of this. So all of the, the D3 brain directions. Um, it's going to fill the D row direction and it's going to wrap the three sphere, which means we end up with two scalar fields on the D7 brain, which correspond to this W and Y, which are going to be functions of rho. Okay. You can write them down as functions of the, the three sphere directions as well, um, but those are simply going to correspond to higher modes. Okay. So what we end up with uh, is a Lagrangian, which is a function of some field W as a function of rho, and some field y. Now we can see immediately that there's actually a U1 symmetry which rotates the W and Y directions. Okay? And in fact, this you can show corresponds precisely to the chiral symmetry um, of the, the field field. So we've got, an, we've got a, a Lagrangian which tells us about uh, W as a function of rho and Y as a function of rho, and this Lagrangian is simply the DBI action. In this case, there's a uh, uh, there's no churn simons term, so we're going to have a DBI action um, which tells us about the behavior of D7 brain in this particular geometry. Okay. So we can solve the DBI action, or we can solve the Lagrangian, the equations of motion, and what we end up with is W and Y as a function of rho, and the solution is simply going to be some solution function W, Y as a function of rho, and it's going to tell us about the brain embedding. Okay? We solve these equations for W and Y, and we get some solutions W of rho and Y of rho, and this simply tells us about the brain embedding. So the pictures that I'm going to give you for the D7 brain, so this is our D7 brain embedding, where rho goes to infinity is our UV, okay? it's the ADS boundary, and rho, W, and Y going to zero is sort of the center of our ADS space. So this W and Y are simply fields on the D7 brain, and exactly the same way as in normal ADS CFT, if we have a field in our supergravity background, it corresponds to an operator on the field theory side. In fact, these fields W and Y correspond to QQ bar operators in the field theory side. So again, there's some U1 symmetry, which is simply a rotation of the W and Y directions, and we can actually solve the equations of motion and choose a solution such that one of them is zero. Okay, so we're just going to set this to zero. And what we end up with then is a very simple picture of a D7 brain in this background where we have rho and we have w. And it turns out that the stable solutions in this case, in the case of pure ADS5 cross S5, are simply flat brain solutions, solutions where omega equals a constant. So this is the D7 brain solution in the ADS in the ADS5 process five background wrapping the S3, and the solutions are about as simple as you could ask for. They're simply constant solutions, omega equals zero solutions. And it turns out that in fact the value of that, this distance here, is really the quark mass. Okay. That's actually not really a gauge invariant statement, but we can think about the separation as really being the separation between the D7 brain and the stack of D3 brains, and the length of that string then corresponds to the mass of the quark. Okay. So in fact, so this is explicit uh, absolutely good. So this is explicit chiral symmetry breaking. So we said that in the QCD Lagrangian, if we add uh, an explicit quark mass, then we break the chiral symmetry explicitly. And indeed, we see that there is also a solution which is simply omega equals zero, or sorry, W 
equals zero, and this W equals zero solution is a solution where we still have an intact Carroll symmetry. Okay, so we put a D7 ring along this axis, and we still have a rotational symmetry in the W and Y directions. Good. So we know from ADS-CFT that when we have a field operator correspondence, they, we have, in general, uh, a normalizable part and a non-normalizable part of our field, in this case, omega. And we can look at this in the UV, and we can see that um, W of rho, so I, I'm calling it omega and, uh, and, and W, just call it W, um, as rho goes to infinity, it actually has a solution you can work out the solution. It goes like M plus C over R squared. So we have two parameters, we have two free parameters, M and C, which we can then set as boundary conditions and see the behavior of D7 brain in the infrared. And it turns out that in ADS5 cross S5, for whatever value of M we put in, <coughs> C not equal to zero is gonna give us an unstable solution, gives us a singular solution, okay? Which is why the solutions are entirely M, M cubed. It turns out that in fact this C corresponds to the VEV of the operator that we're turning on, and this corresponds then to the Q by Q VEV. Okay? So what we see is that um, in any course for super Young mills, if we add in a D7 brain, which corresponds to breaking the supersymmetry to n equals two and adding in quarks, actually the Q by Q condensate is not allowed. Okay? That in fact would break the supersymmetry itself. We can turn on a, a quark mass, but that's all we can do. It turns out that in this model, the constable Myers geometry, we can perform the same calculation. The symmetries of the geometry are slightly different, they're not very different because all we've got is a flowing dilaton. So we can now think of our geometry rather than simply being, well, we've still got this W and, uh, w and rho direction, but now in the center of the space we've got a singularity. Okay. The space itself is sick, but it's going to turn out that we, we don't know too much about that. So in exactly the same way, the behavior of the field W in the UV goes like M plus C over R squared. So way out here, we've just got ADS5 cross S5. It's asymptotically ADS5 cross S5. So out here, we can ask the question again, if we set up some solution with some M and some C, what happens in the center of the space? And it turns out that if we're way up here, if we're a long way from the singularity, we look at some solution up here, it knows nothing about the singularity, and it's, it simply feels like it's in pure ADS5 cross S5, and the solution again is flat which tells us that the stable solution in the M C plane for large mass is going to be zero condensate. But it turns out that as we get to small values of the mass, actually the solution does acquire a condensate. In fact, it looks something like this. So what this means is that in the UV of the theory, we have a, a, chiral, a chiral symmetry. So in the UV of the theory out here, we do actually have a U1 symmetry, okay? But in the IR of the theory, theory, the symmetry is broken. So the behavior of the D7 brain corresponds to the breaking of the chiral symmetry, which in fact corresponds to the fact that we've turned on a Q bar condensate. So what this means is that in this ADS QCD model, we have a, a really nice geometric interpretation of chiral symmetry breaking. Okay? We didn't put in the fact that we had a non-zero condensate by hand. It simply came out as the only stable solution in the massless limit. Actually, there's a, there's a metastable solution, which is, as n goes to zero, it goes straight through the, through the singularity, but of course we don't trust it. So I, I simplify things a, a lot here by saying that we, ju we just take the DBI action and we write down the, the Lagrangian in terms of the, the Y and W, the, the W and Y fields, the, the two transverse directions, the D7 brain, in fact, there's also a gauge field that lives on the D7, right? the, the, the U1 gauge field, and we can expand the whole thing. And in fact, it turns out that the effective theory of the D7 brain matches very nicely with the Carroll Lagrangian. Now, the current Carroll Lagrangian is an effective theory of pions and vector mesons, and we can match up the so-called Gatta-Leutmiller coefficients, with the co which are the coefficients in front of each term. Here, U is an exponentiated pion uh, operator. Okay, so you can expand this and match up coefficients between the DVI action, including the gauge field, 
in this constable Myers geometry and the effective field theory of pions, and you actually find there's a, there's a really nice match. So, Carroll symmetry breaking is turned into a geometrical symmetry breaking in the in the supergravity side. Um, one can one can look not only at the values of the mass and the condensate. We can ask about excitations on top of the condensate. So we can look at the, the higher order corrections to this. So we can say we've got some W of rho, but we've also got uh, we can do a, an expansion in excitations of, of W of rho. And these correspond to meson excitations themselves. We solve the equations of motion, and that, those give us the meson masses. So we can look at the meson mass then as a function of the, of the, of the quark mass, the bare quark mass. And in fact, it's, it matches perfectly with the gelman x renner relation, which is a relation we can also get from here, which links the, uh, the quark mass, the pion mass, and the pion decay constant. So what's at the scale? Is it of the parallel symmetry breaking? Oh, so it's, and, uh, yeah, so it's actually the, the flow of the dilaton. There's a scale that comes in from the flow of the dilaton, and that one scale then fixes completely the, the Carroll symmetry scale. So all the measured masses are determined in that scale? It, exactly, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so in the case of the, the Constable Myers dilaton flow geometry, we have this singular region in the geometry, which isn't very healthy, but the D7 brains, because they are always repelled from the singularity, it turns out that the physics of those actually we can, we can trust over. So we can go to a different geometry, which is simply the ADS Schwarzschild geometry, and we can also ask the question, what happens there? So that's just finite temperature Yang Mills. Um, we take ADS Schwarzschild, we haven't turned on any other <coughs> Operators, simply uh, the, the finite temperature version of the Yang Mills theory. And in that case, in the same coordinate system, we end up with a picture which looks very similar, except now this really is a black hole. Okay. And the temperature then sets the one scale in the, in the problem. So again, we can ask the question if we've got a, a black hole, an ADS Schwarzschild geometry, and we take a D7 brain, what's the uh, what are the consistent solutions for the D7 brain, and can we ask about the, the hadronic spectrum, the spectrum, the meson spectrum of excitations on top of the D7 brain, and indeed you can. But in the case of the, the, the singular geometry we had before, the singularity repelled the D7 brain. In this case, in fact, the singularity, oh, it's not a singularity, it's now a horizon, now attracts the D7 brain. So we get solutions which look something like this. Um, of course, out here, we get the same solutions because they know nothing about what's happening here. Down here, for, for zero quark mass, we get a solution that looks look like that. So in fact, in this case, what you find is that there is a condensate for intermediate quark mass. So there's a condensate here, so these solutions are not constant solutions. This is a constant solution, and this is a constant solution. But there's some intermediate region where the condensate is non-zero. But of course, the, the Carroll symmetry in this case has been explicitly broken by the fact that there's a quark mass here. And so this is, this is not spontaneous Carroll symmetry breaking. Okay? The Carroll symmetry breaking is coming from the explicit breaking here. Whereas in the, in the previous case here, the Carroll symmetry is broken in the massless limit, so this is really spontaneous symmetry breaking. So this is a plot again of the condensate against the mass. And in fact, there's a phase transition uh, around here there's a first order phase transition between um, the, these configurations and the configurations which actually hit the black hole. Um, and in fact, you can, you can study that uh, at this region uh, of the condensate mass diagram. So we see no <coughs> spontaneous Carroll symmetry breaking here. So we can now ask the question, what happens if we turn in the magnetic field? So as I said, in fact, the DBI action, so that's DBI for the D7 brains, go something like d a theta square root minus the determinant of the pullback of the pullback metric onto the d8 brain plus some gauge field configuration. And if we just put in a single uh, d7 brain, which corresponds to putting in a single flavor of quarks, then we have simply U1 gauge field here. Okay. So we can look at both the 
um, the sort of classical solution here, and also excitations on top of that. It turns out that turning on here a source, so FAB or F, let's say 1, 2, equals BZ, we can turn on, in the gauge theory of magnetic field, in the Z direction. So we have a choice, we can turn on various components of FAB and ask what the behavior then of the gauge theory is to turning on these background fields. It turns out that when we do that, when we turn on precisely a magnetic field in the Z direction by turning on the one, two component of the gauge field on the brain, actually what happens is that these solutions begin to be repelled up here. In fact, they're repelled so much that if you take um, the solution which previously was the massless, massless solution, which, so this is the ADS Schwarzschild geometry. We take a D7 brain and we look at the solution which is mass, corresponds to massless quarks, falls straight into the black hole. In fact, when we turn in the magnetic field, it turns out that we get, again, spontaneous chiral symmetry. Okay. So we get MQ equals zero with a finite condensate, the U1 symmetry is spontaneously broken, or the U1 geometrical symmetry in this picture is now broken. So it seems that turning on, that, turning on a magnetic field gives us a spontaneous chiral symmetry breakthrough. And this is the so-called uh, magnetic catalysis of chiral symmetry breakthrough. And in fact, this is exactly what you expect uh, from a, a theory like this. So you can look at the, the NJL, not NJL model, the nambu general lacinia model, this effective four for fermion interacting theory, turn on a magnetic field and you find that indeed there's a, uh, an, uh, an enhancement of the QQ bar um, attraction, <coughs> the quark-anti-quark -quark attraction, um, which leads to the condensation of the QQ bar pairs, and you end up with the spontaneous breaking of the chiral symmetry via turning on the magnetic field. Is this a constant magnetic field? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a constant magnetic field. It's not dynamical. We shouldn't think of this as a, um, a this is not a gauge U1. This is a global U1. One, one can actually weakly age this when you think of turning on this as a dynamical field, but in all of this it's simply a background background field constant everywhere. Yeah. But if by this you think this also have a boundary like Yeah it, exactly so in fact it's not bad on the boundary of the Pre precisely boundary. so in fact this couples to the operator which corresponds then precisely to turning on a magnetic field also on the boundary. Yeah. So it, it looks like a magnetic field here, it's also a magnetic field in the boundary theorem. Field do not have right? So the, the point is that there's a U1 symmetry, so the quarks have a U1 symmetry, and that's the global symmetry that we're, uh, we're turning a magnetic field on for. So now we're going to get to the Sakai Sugimoto model. And the reason I wanted to go through looking at just ADS5 process 5 and then looking at the Constable Myers geometry and then looking at the ADS Schwarzschild geometry is this one is a, a little more complicated, but not that much more complicated. So in fact, this model is one where we take, um, so we're going to be looking at this at finite temperature. So here, this is Witten's D4 brain model, where we take a stack of D4 brains and we wrap them on a circle, so we end up with um, below some uh, kaluza klein scale given by the, the size of the circle, we end up with an effective 3 plus 1 dimensional theory. Um, there's actually two scales here. So in what is original D4, D4 brain background, there's just a single scale given by the kaluza klein scale. In fact, now we're looking at black D4 brains on a circle. So we have a kaluza klein scale and we have a temperature scale T. And in fact, it turns out that there are two competing geometries. There's one which is um, the equivalent of ADS Schwarzschild, and there's one which is simply thermal ADS. Okay? And the difference between the two corresponds to whether, whether essentially there's a, um, a cigar-like geometry in the temporal direction or the spatial direction. I'll show you the pictures in a minute. So here we have um, the, the geometry. There's also a flowing diloton. Um, and there's a, there's a field, um, uh, an RR field turn, uh, turned on. But here we have some warp factor F of U, and the placement of the F of U depends on whether we're in thermal ADS or in ADS Schwarzschild. 
So it turns out that at low temperatures, the ground state, and you can do this simply by looking at the, the free energy of the two theories, um, to, we, we end up with a warp factor actually in the X4 direction. Um, and so although we saw yesterday this ADS picture where um, we had a time direction like this, now we have a thermal circle, so the time direction tau is actually a circle here, and there's a cutoff here which is given by U equals UKK, so U is the equivalent of what we had as R before. Okay. So this is thermal ADS, where we have a cigar geometry now um, in the U direction for the X4 circle, which is the Kaluga Klein circle, and there's another geometry which is the black hole geometry where we now have this F tilde, where F tilde is related to the temperature, that's now in front of the tau direction, and so this is the geometry where the cigar-like part is actually in the tau direction, and this is ATS portion. So, sorry, it's in the U direction, but it's a, it's a cut off, it's a shrinking circle um, of the tau direction. And these two compete, so in fact there's a phase transition here, so if we look simply in the temperature direction, so there's two scales, there's now a temperature scale and a kaluza klein scale, there's a competition between the two, and there's a Hawking page phase transition between thermal ADS at low temperature and ADS Schwarzschild at high temperature. In fact, there's a question about whether this is really the Hawking page phase transition. There, there's an idea that in fact, um, there, there might be a, a phase transition to a, a, a type 2b geometry um, coming from a, a, a different instability, which I'm not going to get into. Okay. So the pictures in this case are slightly more complicated, but not enormously more complicated. So now remember we have our two pictures. We have the picture of thermal ADS, where we have a tau circle, and we have an X4 circle, and in <coughs> thermal ADS, it's the X4 circle that shrinks as we go in the U direction. So this is U equals infinity, which is the ADS boundary, and this here is U equals UKK. Okay. So here we have the X4 direction. And of course, the the, bro the probes that we're going to put in, which in this case is going to be D8 brains, they fill the tau direction. So this, this is always completely filled. Now we can think about t putting in probes here. Okay? We can think about putting a single probe in. Um, we can do it like this. Yeah. We can think about putting a single probe in, and that probe is simply going to look something like this. But in fact, the probe can't simply end down here. The probe needs to come up the other side. And in fact, it turns out that this is a D8 brain, and it links up with a D8 bar brain. Okay. Now, if you took two brains and you put them in, each one of those brains would independently have a U1 symmetry on them. Each one has a, uh, has a gauge field and has a U1 symmetry. So independently, there's a U1, let's call it left, for the D8, and a U1 right for the D8 bar. But in fact, because they link up, you lose one of the, the symmetries and it's broken down to the vector subgroup. Okay. So in fact, in this picture you have a very different uh, idea, ge geometrical idea of chiral symmetry breaking, which corresponds to the linking of the U1 symmetry on the D D8 brain and the U1 symmetry on the D8 bar brain. So this corresponds to putting in both left and right-handed flavor quarks, and because they couple because of the linking here, here the chiral symmetry is broken. Now, in the case of the ATS Schwarzschild geometry, where the shrinking circles are swapped, in fact, in this case, what we end up with, so this is high temperature, remember. Here we have a D8 brain, which simply fills that direction, and a D8 brain, which sits there, and they don't need to link in this case. And you can simply show the geometry works, that these can be completely independent, and we don't have a broken chiral symmetry here. So here we really do have a U1 left cross U1 right. So in fact, we see here that what corresponds to a confinement deconfinement phase transition, sorry, this is the, the deconfined phase, this is the confined phase, 
In the confined phase, we do get parallel symmetry breaking. So this is breaking geometrically seen like this. And in the deconfined phase, the parallel symmetry is not broken. You can show that there's no QQ bar, Q -Q -bar coming through. I'm not going to get through the details of this. Okay, so this is the picture that. Uh, so it turns out that when we have these antipodally, okay, that is to say, sitting at opposite sides of this circle, these are the only options. Okay? And in fact, this corresponds to turning on uh, zero mass quarks. Okay? When they're antipodal, the quark masses are zero. There's another way of doing this, which is that we can put the, the D brains non antipodally. In fact, that's exactly the picture here. So if we put them non antipodally, it turns out that there's actually still a zero constituent quark mass, uh, sorry, a zero bare quark mass, but it corresponds to turning on a finite constituent quark mass. Okay. Now there's three possibilities. So they're no longer antipodal. In the low temperature phase, which is this phase here, there's no cho choice but for the brains, the, the D8 and the D8 bra to link up. Okay. So it's a confined phase, okay. low temperature is a confined phase, and the chiral symmetry is broken. Above TC, where we've gone past the Hawking page phase transition, and we're now into the ABS Schwarzschild geometry from thermal ABS, it turns out that there's a, there's a phase where chiral symmetry is still broken, but the theory is deconfined. And then at higher temperature still, there's a phase where it's both deconfined and chiral symmetry is restored. Turning on a finite chemical potential corresponds to turning on the F0U component of the gauge field. And in fact, the U goes to infinity dependent of the, the gauge potential, A0, corresponds to turning on mu here. Okay. So turning on this particular field corresponds to turning on a source for an operator, and that source is just the chemical potential, and the operator itself is just the, the baryon density. So it turns out that turning this on really corresponds to turning on uh, a set of fundamental strings which want to stretch <coughs> between the horizon, if there is a horizon, and the tip of the brain. And this wants to pull the D brains in this picture wants to pull the D brains down in this direction. So we can think of this as a stack of fundamental strings which correspond to a finite uh, baryon density or a finite quark density. Okay. So this alters the phase structure such that now, so at zero chemical potential, we have these three, these three phases. We had the confined chiral symmetry broken phase, the deconfined chiral symmetry broken phase, and the deconfined chiral restored phase. But now when we turn on a finite chemical potential, it turns out that this phase here is disfavored because the, the set of strings here, the, the fundamental strings here, actually want to pull this down into, this, into the region at the bottom here, a UKK, and in fact we end up with a currently restored phase. We saw previously that turning on a magnetic field would appear to want to give us chiral symmetry breaking. So whereas turning on, a, turning on a chemical potential appears to disfavor this phase, okay, turning on a magnetic field seems to want to give us a chiral symmetry broken phase, even in the deconfined setup. We have, no, we have no choice in the confined phase but for the chiral symmetry to be broken. So naively, this is what we would expect in the magnetic field chemical potential plane. We would expect that um, at zero magnetic field, we know there's a chiral symmetry broken phase and a chiral, chirally symmetric phase. But we'd, we would expect that the chiral, chiral symmetry broken phase would be enhanced because remember that turning on a magnetic field favors the production of the QQ bar condensation. In fact, there's a subtlety which I don't have time to go into now that corresponds to the appearance of um, higher Landau levels um, in the theory, which actually maps very nicely onto something similar in the NJL model. 
So that naive picture that we had before, so this is a picture of B versus mu, appears to be pretty well matched. So here we have a Carroll symmetry broken phase, here we have a Carroll Carroll symmetric phase. But in fact, if you look at very low values of B, very low values of magnetic at relatively high chemical potential, actually what you find is that as you increase B, this Carroll symmetry broken phase is, for some time at least for small values of B, disfavored, okay? which is a very, very strange result. And this is in fact the result of inverse magnetic catalysis. So this is the magnetic catalysis. You turn on a, a magnetic field and this region is enhanced, but in fact it's diminished for small values of the magnetic field. I don't have time to, to go into the details, but essentially one can understand this by looking at the, uh, the change in the free energy as you go uh, across this phase transition. And whereas a weak coupling, there's simply a term that looks like this, B m, squ m squared over 2 minus mu squared, and this gives you exactly, exactly what you would expect from Carroll car symmetry breaking, the catalysis of Carroll symmetry breaking from the magnetic field. In fact, it turns out that at strong coupling, so this can't give you inverse magnetic catalysis, at strong coupling, you can get inverse magnetic catalysis because the, the change in the free energy across here actually corresponds to this, where there's a term mu squared b, but this term here, m to the 7 over 2, actually you can do an expansion of small b, and you find that there's a term which is constant, and then, then there's a term which goes with b squared. And in fact, it's this which appears to give rise to, Carlson, to inverse magnetic catalysis. And I'm almost done with policy. So what we've been doing, so what I didn't say is that the previous calculations of this by Price, Rabin, and Schmidt, they make quite a big approximation. So what they do is they take this geometry, but they only look at solutions which look like this, where they're far from antipodal, which corresponds essentially to the temperature scale being much, much lower than the quark mass scale, or the, the constituent quark mass scale. What they actually do is they take the F of U that we saw before, which was the, the sort of the thermal warp factor, and they set it to one. Okay? It's, it's certainly close to one up here, but it's not close to one down here. Okay? So this approximation actually allowed them to perform the calculations. What we've been doing for more or less the last year and a half is going beyond this approximation to ask if there's any more phase structure when we include uh, the, the term which does depend on the And it turns out that we do find some more phase structure. There seems to be another phase transition. This is actually in the T, B phase for different values of the chemical potential. Um, and it seems that there is some more phase structure there. Um, and hopefully in the next two weeks we're going to have the results. So Robert very, very kindly allowed me to have my talk right <coughs> at the end because I hope to have a, a really strong conclusion and we don't have it quite yet, but hopefully we're going to understand the phase structure um, of this. So essentially each of these colored dots corresponds to a single chemical potential and we now understand more about the structure as the chemical potential reaches some critical value and we get a rather interesting phase transition here where we seem to have a critical point and something which is not just a first order phase transition as we have in this case. So I think I'm probably out of time there. So I'm going to wrap up, wrap up by saying that in order to really understand the behavior of probes in inside heavy ion collisions and also the behavior of uh, magnetars and the neutron stars in general, we really need to understand these rather exotic phenomena um, in QCD. And it seems that the ADS QCD correspondence gives us some window into some of these phenomena. So what I didn't say, in fact, was that the Nambu Journal Licinia model also gives us inverse magnetic catalysis. Okay, so this phenomenon that we see here in this ADS QCD model is mimicked in a very sort of well-respected effective field theory model of QCD. And I think I should probably stop there. Thank you. Maybe another effect of final temperature, large temperature. You know, one is interested in the, the axial mass, the cosmology, and that kind of Sure. And that would be computing the temperature dependence of the topological system. Yeah, I, I think so. So, so here, in fact, we, we are looking at 
various aspects of susceptibility, right. but not the topological. So this is the magnetic, so what would you do in the, uh, that's, in the that's Sakai? That's a question. What would Sakai and Sogunoto do? So I, I think to understand the topological susceptibility, so I didn't talk about it here, I only talked about the DBI action. In fact, there's a Chern-Simons term, and that Chern-Simons term corresponds precisely to the Western, you know, Witten term, um, the, the theta angle in QCD. So, uh, term, so there, there is absolutely a term which mimics the, the theta term. So I, I imagine what you would have to do is to, to look at the behavior of that theta term. So you just uh, want to evaluate the theta which is function of theta. Precisely. Yeah. So you have a term. Yes, there, there is a term.